This was the first problem at the 2024 International Math Olympiad. We'll solve it completely, leaving no stone unturned. We need to find all real numbers alpha, such that this sum of floor functions, which we'll call S sub N of alpha, is a multiple of N for every positive integer N. A great starting point for all real numbers problems is to test the integers. Let's see what structure they reveal. Let's assume alpha is an integer, m. We substitute m into the sum. Since j and m are integers, their product is an integer, so the floor function has no effect. The sum simplifies to the sum of j times m. The term m is a constant with respect to the summation variable j, so we can factor it out. This leaves us with m times the sum of the first n positive integers. We can replace this sum with its well-known closed form expression. This gives us m times the end of the triangular number. The problem requires n to divide this expression for all positive integers n. Because n is a positive integer, this divisibility condition is equivalent to the expression without n being an integer. This simplifies the condition m times n plus 1 divided by 2 must be an integer for all n. Now, if n is an odd number, n plus 1 is even, so the expression is always an integer for any integer m. But if n is even, n plus 1 is odd, which means m must be even to cancel the 2 in the denominator. Since the condition must hold for all n, it must hold for the even values. The simplest even number to test is n equals 2. For 3m over 2 to be an integer, the factor of 2 in the denominator must be cancelled. This forces m to be even. So we've shown that if an integer solution m exists, it must be even. This proves necessity. Now for sufficiency. Does every even integer actually work? Let's say alpha is an even integer, which we can write as 2 times t for some integer t. We substitute 2t into our formula for the sum and we can see that the 2s in the numerator and denominator will cancel. This leaves t times n times n plus 1. This expression clearly has n as a factor, so it is always divisible by n. This proves that all even integers are indeed solutions. Now, we must prove that no non-integer solutions exist. The argument here must be absolutely watertight. The key is this identity. If x is an integer, the floor of x and the floor of negative x are opposites, summing to zero. But if x is not an integer, say i plus a fractional part f, then the floor of negative x becomes negative i minus 1, and the two floors sum to negative 1. Let's apply this identity to the sum of s sub n of alpha and s sub n of negative alpha. Let k be the set of indices j from 1 to n, for which j times alpha is an integer. For all indices not in this set k, the term in the sum is negative 1. The sum is therefore the negative of the total number of terms, n minus the size of the set k. First, let's assume alpha is an irrational number. If alpha is irrational, then j times alpha is also irrational for any positive integer j, so it's never an integer. This means the set k is always empty and its size is zero. Substituting this into our identity, we get that the sum of s sub n of alpha and s sub n of negative alpha is simply negative n. Now, assume for the sake of contradiction that our irrational alpha is a solution. This means s sub n of alpha is some integer, let's call it a sub n times n. We can substitute this into our equation. This gives us a sub n times n plus s sub n of negative alpha equals negative n. Solving for s sub n of negative alpha, we find that s sub n of negative alpha is also a multiple of n. This is a useful symmetry. If an irrational number alpha is a solution, then so is its negative. Furthermore, notice that if we subtract an even integer, say 2t from alpha, the new sum is related to the old sum in a simple way. 
The sum for alpha minus 2t is equal to the original sum for alpha minus t times n times n plus 1. Since both the original sum and the subtracted term are divisible by n, the new sum must be as well. This means we can add or subtract any even integer from a solution, and it remains a solution. These symmetries mean we can, without loss of generality, just focus on an alpha between negative 1 and 1. If we find no solutions here, there are no irrational solutions anywhere. Let's call this value epsilon. The problem reduces to this condition on epsilon, and because of the symmetry with its negative, we can just analyze the case where epsilon is in the interval from 0 to 1. Let's choose a special value of n, which we'll call n sub 0, defined as the ceiling of 1 over epsilon. For any j strictly less than n sub 0, j times epsilon is less than 1. Therefore, the floor of j times epsilon is 0 for all of these initial terms in the sum. This means the sum up to n sub 0 collapses, leaving only the very last term. So, for our chosen n sub 0, the condition becomes n sub 0 must divide the floor of n sub 0 times epsilon. But let's look closer at that term. By definition of the ceiling function, n sub 0 is between 1 over epsilon and 1 over epsilon plus 1. Multiplying by epsilon gives a tight bound. Since epsilon is between 0 and 1, 1 plus epsilon is less than 2. This pins the value of n sub 0 times epsilon to be between 1 and 2. Because it can't be an integer, its floor must be exactly 1. The condition n sub 0 must divide 1 forces n sub 0 to be 1. But for the ceiling of 1 over epsilon to be 1, epsilon would have to be greater than or equal to 1. This contradicts epsilon being a fractional part. This is a solid contradiction. No irrational solutions exist. Finally, we analyze rational non-integers. Let alpha be a rational number p over q in lowest terms, where the denominator q is greater than 1. j times alpha is an integer if and only if q divides j, since p and q are coprime. The size of our set k is the number of multiples of q up to n, which is the floor of n over q. Plugging this into our identity gives a specific formula for the rational case. Let's assume this rational alpha is a solution, meaning the sum is a multiple of n. Substituting this into the identity gives us this relation. Rearranging the terms shows that the floor of n over q is equal to s sub n of negative alpha plus a multiple of n. This implies that the floor of n over q and s sub n of negative alpha are congruent modulo n. While interesting, there's a more direct path, similar to the one we took for irrationals. As before, we can subtract any even integer from a solution. We can also use the symmetry with its negative. This allows us to analyze any non-integer rationale by looking at a related value in the interval 0 to 1. Let's analyze alpha equal to p over q in this interval. A known result for sums of floors of rational multiples is Hermite's identity. It's worth noting the identity starts from j equals 0, but since the floor of 0 is just 0, it gives the same value as our sum, which starts from 1. Let's choose n to be q minus 1. The problem requires this n to divide the sum up to this point. Using the identity, we know the exact value of this sum. For q minus 1 to divide this expression, p minus 1 over 2 must be an integer. This forces p to be odd. Now let's test the next integer, n equals q. The sum up to q is the previous sum plus the term for j equals q, which is the floor of p, or just p. We need q to divide this expression. Let's see what this implies by analyzing it modulo q. Modulo q, the term q minus 1, is congruent to negative 1. Simplifying the expression, we find that the sum is congruent to p plus 1 all over 2. For the sum to be divisible by q, this congruence must be 0. This means p plus 1 must be a multiple of 2 times q. But we assumed p was strictly less than q. This means p plus 1 
is less than q plus 1. Since q is greater than 1, it's impossible for p plus 1 to be a multiple of 2q. This is our final contradiction. No rational non-integers are solutions. Let's assemble our results into a final, complete answer. Our case-by-case -case analysis proved that any potential solution must be an even integer, as all other cases led to a contradiction. And our initial check confirmed that every even integer does, in fact, satisfy the condition for all n. Combining necessity and sufficiency gives our complete characterization. Alpha must be an even integer. And that wraps up our complete solution to this international math Olympiad problem. The interplay between number theory, floor functions, and careful case analysis creates a beautiful mathematical story. If you enjoyed this deep dive into rigorous proof techniques, I'd really appreciate it if you could hit that like button and subscribe for more math content. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.